So, yes, this is the conclusion of your series, which you've been looking at the interesting things that have been happening uh, to Israel on the wilderness journey. But what we have to appreciate is that uh, there's a big time gap between what you've been looking at in the past and what we're looking at now. So we know the wilderness journey lasted for 40 years, started with the exodus from Egypt and ended when they passed over Jordan into Gilgal. And you were looking at the spies in chapter 13 and Korah, Dathan and Abiram and I think there was something else, but they were in the first two years. We're now jumping to the 40th year. So a huge gap, 38 years gap um, between what you were looking at before uh, and what we have here. So uh, it's, as we're reading through, one doesn't appreciate as we end chapter 19 and come to chapter 20, there is this big time gap. So let's just hone in on the 40th year. Uh, we're just going to be looking at a few incidents here from these two chapters. We're going to look at the death of Miriam, which took place in the first month of that year. The smiting of the rock, we're not told exactly when, but it was uh, within a month or two of the death of Miriam. Uh, Josephus talks about there being 30 days mourning for Miriam, so it, it probably was in the second month or the third month, we're not quite sure. We know the death of Aaron was on the first day of the fifth month. Um, the brazen serpent, we're not exactly sure when, but within probably a month or two. Uh, of the death of Aaron because there was the 30 days mourning for Aaron's death uh, and then they had to journey um, the incident of the brazen serpent. And then uh, lying uh, just at the end of chapter 21, it was the beginning of them going up to conquer the East Bank uh, and that occupied uh, probably a couple of months. And then we come to the 11th month of the 40th year, and the book of Deuteronomy occupies that period uh, from the first of the month. Moses dies at the end of the month, uh, and there is the 12th month is spent on mourning. And then Joshua picks up and they cross over the River Jordan on the 10th day of the first month of the 41st year in order that they could be over the river to pick their lambs uh, and circumcision at Gilgal in order that they could keep the Passover exactly 40 years after they left because they didn't leave on the first of the uh, first month uh, of the first year. They left on the 15th day after the Passover. So that, that's, uh, we're looking at, at those uh, first four items there. So, dealing with death of Miriam, smiting the rock at Kadesh, death of Aaron on Mount Hor, and the brazen serpent in the wilderness. So, we read in chapter 1, uh, and the critical word is the whole congregation. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now we know that uh, on their wilderness journey they came up from uh, the Red Sea, from Ezion Geba, to Kadesh 37 years, 38 years before, and had remained in the area of Kadesh Barnea. And it would seem that during that long period that they were there, that the tribes would just wander a bit outwards to find pasture land, and they seemed to be a little bit scattered. And... Time passes on, and now a decree must obviously gone forth from Moses and Aaron to gather together. The 40th, the last year, uh, has commenced, uh, and they've got to begin to get ready to conquer the land. So they come together, even the whole congregation. So they've come back uh, from where they are scattered around Kadesh. They've all reassembled at Kadesh. And... That is where Miriam dies and was buried. Um, so, yes, the, going from Ezion Geba up to uh, Kadesh, uh, Numbers 33, let's say that was about 37 years earlier. So, if we just look at the map. Um, I travelled downwards. Uh, Ezion Geba is number 11, uh, and then Kadesh Barnea is up at number 12 there. So, 
what do we know about Miriam? Well, we know that as a child, she watched the ark which Moses had been placed in by his mother. Um, and though she isn't named in Exodus chapter 2, we know that there were only three children, 1 Chronicles 4 verse 17 tells us. So we know it was Miriam who was the sister who uh, called the mother um, and it, uh, the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter agreed that Moses' mother, not that she knew it was Moses' mother, she just thought it was one of the uh, nurses, uh, she looked after Moses until he went into uh, Pharaoh's house. So I, I, I would guess that uh, we don't know how old she was, but you know, she must have been responsible. So I would guess something between probably eight and ten, just a guess. What is more important, when we get to Exodus chapter 15, <coughs> she is called a prophetess, Miriam the prophetess. We'll see the bearing on that in a moment. The other incident which you dealt with in Numbers chapter 12, um, where she and Aaron conspired against Moses for his marriage, uh, and she was struck with leprosy, and the camp had to remain until she was cleansed from that leprosy. And Deuteronomy chapter 24 was spoken by Moses probably about six, seven, eight, nine months after the death of Miriam. And he reminded his congregation to remember what Yahweh their God did unto Miriam, by the way, after that you were come forth out of Egypt. In other words, don't be rebellious. I'm coming to the end of my life. Joshua is going to be your leader. Don't rebel against him like Miriam and Aaron did rebel against me. So if she was 10, then she would have been 130. Um, if she was 8, she'd be 128. We know Aaron was 123. We know that from Numbers 33. And we know that Moses was 120. And all three of that family all died within 11 months of each other. So a new generation had to rise. God clearly uh, had finished with those three leaders. They had performed their work. Joshua, Eliezer, a younger generation were going to be uh, put forward as the ones that would take them into the promised land. And so they were, as it were, temporarily laid on one side. We know uh, in the truth that it is but a sleep and Miriam and Moses and Aaron will rise again and enter into their inheritance. But now is not the time in God's plan. And they illustrate really the weakness of the law because they were standing for the law um, and the law was weak. It was a priesthood which was uh, had a weakness because it was mortal. And we shall pick that up a bit later on. So another very important passage which indicates to us that Miriam played a big role in the Exodus is in Micah chapter 6 and verse 4. For I brought thee out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron and Miriam. So we have these three are linked together as the ones that brought them out of Egypt. So we read very little about Miriam. But when we think about Moses was a shepherd and he was, as it were, a king, a shepherd king over Israel. Aaron was the priest and Miriam was the prophet, the prophetess. So again, no symbolizing the law, which had to have three different people, prophet, priest and kings. Whereas under the new covenant, one person, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, will combine all those roles because the order of Melchizedek is so much more superior to the law of Moses. So we then next come to this rebellion of the people 
The water supply obviously runs out and there is no water. Uh, and they complain before Moses and say, would that we had died when our forefathers died before Yahweh. You brought up this congregation. There's no sea, there's no figs, there's no vines or pomegranates, there's no water. They were very disgruntled. And Moses and Aaron rush to the tabernacle, fearing that God is going to bring judgments as he has in the past. And they fall upon their faces and the glory of Yahweh appears to them, end of verse 6. And so they were instructed uh, how to bring forth water. And we'll look at the detail of that, but let's just put together. You've looked at Exodus chapter 17, and I don't know whether at the time the contrast was made with Numbers chapter 20. Uh, if so, then it'll be a repetition. So Exodus chapter 17 is the incident of the first smiting, which took place in the first year of the wilderness journey. And here we are in Numbers 20, which is the last year, the 40th year of the wilderness journey. Uh, the incident at Rephidim is known as Massa and Meribah, temptation and strife or provocation, because they said, is Yahweh among us or not? Uh, and God showed that he was among them by providing them with water. The incident at Kadesh is just referred to as Meribah, strife and provocation, because the children of Israel strove with Yahweh and he was sanctified in them. On the first incident, it was the Moses rod which had turned into the serpent, which had uh, smitten the river Nile and turned it into blood and very specifically we're told that it was that rod that was used to smite the rock in Exodus chapter 17 whereas in Numbers chapter 20 we're going to see that Aaron uh, or Moses takes the rod from before the tabernacle this is Aaron's rod that had blossomed and budded and brought forth fruit the two words for rock are different in the one incident in 17, it's the rock is Zur, uh, a rocky cliff or a wall, whereas in Numbers chapter 20, it's the word Selah, which can be a cliff, but normally it is just a craggy outcrop, a craggy rock. Exodus 17 was done in the presence of the elders. Uh, Numbers 20 was done in the whole congregation. In Exodus 17, Yahweh stood on the rock and Moses smote it and it produced water. In this incident, against God's commands, he smote it twice, but again, it brought forth water. So let's look at the bit more detail between the, um, of what happened in Numbers chapter 20. So in uh, verses 7 to 8, I've put down on the one side the instructions which God gave, and on the other side what Moses actually did. And you can see it's actually a chiasm. And so we, we can see the differences where, them, where it went wrong, as it were. So he was told, take the rod, gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. And we read that, yes, Moses took the rod from before Yahweh as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. <coughs> now he had been told to speak unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. Now we know how Moses was very angry with the rebellion of the people. And he also, it is apparent from what we should see in a moment, that he lacked faith. <laughs> to bring forth water from a rock by smiting it is a, a miracle indeed. But to actually just speak to a rock and it bring forth water, that was a much harder thing to do. Uh, and Moses, in his anger, didn't believe that just speaking to the rock could do it. They'd been commanded to take a rod, and though it was a different rod, 
Uh, remembering what he did the first time, in his anger he hit it twice. But it, it's interesting because uh, uh, instead of uh, speaking unto the rock, he spoke unto the people uh, and said, Hear now ye rebels, must we fetch you out water out of this rock? Now the interesting thing, that's why I put the Strong's numbers there, that that word is exactly the same as bring forth. So God has said, thou shalt bring forth water. Uh, and Moses says, shall we bring forth water? Because God didn't intend Moses to say it in that way, did he? It was to speak to the rock. Now, whether God told him what to say uh, isn't told. And I would assume that probably God didn't tell him. It was part of the testing of Moses. <laughs> But he just said, speak to the rock. And Moses would then be left to say, you know, what words would he say to this rock? And it will bring forth water. Well, we know he didn't. And instead of bringing honour to God, instead of saying God is doing all of this, he says, we, Moses and Aaron, must we bring forth water for you? And he smites the rock with his rod. But God still provides the water. Um... Uh, and the whole congregation drank, and their beasts also. So we can see, as I say, it's a very neat chiasm. So Moses' sin was to leave God out of the equation, took it upon himself and Moses, we're bringing forth water. And so the response of God the sentence that God passed upon them in verses 12 and 13, again, is very significant. Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with Yahweh, and he was sanctified in them. Now, the word believed, amen, is to trust. And as so often with scriptural words, if we see the first usage, the first usage of this word is in Genesis 15, verse 6. Abraham looked up at the stars and he believed in what God had said. He trusted that God would provide a seed for him. And obviously, in a moment of anger and disbelief, Moses and Aaron didn't believe that just speaking to a rock could bring forth water. And so God wasn't sanctified. And it's a fairly common word in the Old Testament to set apart to make clean, to make holy. And again, its first usage is in Genesis chapter 2. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So they hadn't sanctified God. They hadn't put God first. They put themselves first. And that is a great lesson to us. We have to sanctify God in all our lives. We have to suppress self. Whatever we do, it is to the honour of God. So God was sanctified, brought in honour before the congregation because he brought forth water and they were very thankful for the water. But Moses and Aaron had, because of their lack of faith in what they had been told to do, in their disobedience of the command, not only... Uh, brought a sentence of death upon themselves, but it broke the pattern of what these two incidents, Numbers uh, 20 and Exodus chapter 17, uh, what the two incidents are all about. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 23, Moses pleads with God for forgiveness. Let me go over the land. But God says, no, you will not go over the land, into the land. So there are three passages which talk about this uh, 
rebellion. In uh, chapter, in verse uh, 24, and the time of the death of Aaron, uh, Numbers 20 and verse 24, it says, Because you rebelled against my word at the waters of Meribah, you have to die. And then later on in Numbers 27, it was repeated, For ye rebelled against my commandment to sanctify me at the waters before their eyes. And when it comes to the time for Moses to die, because ye trespassed against me, because ye sanctify me not in the midst of the children of Israel. So there was... Uh, Rebellion, uh, 3784, is to be disobedient and to be rebellious. They have disobeyed God's explicit command. Um, but in the Numbers 27, um, sorry, the um, Deuteronomy 32, because ye trespassed against me. That's an interesting word, to act unfaithfully, to act treacherously, it's also the same word that is used in a, a marital situation, a marital infidelity, infidelity, to act unfaithfully. So they had not only uh, been disobedient to God's word, but had acted unfaithfully in not bringing honour to God who had instructed them. So, as I say, a great lesson for us. We have to accept the word of God as being true. We have to honour our Heavenly Father and honour the Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed us. So let's look at the parable of the smitten rock again. You might have looked at this uh, when you're looking at the earlier incident. We know from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, that that rock represented Christ. So in the first instance, here was a parable of the Lord Jesus Christ being smitten. And when at the end of Moses' life, among the last words of Moses, he looks at these filled with the Spirit and looks back at those things and says, using Brother Thomas's translation, let thy thummim and thy urim, the glory and the light, be of the man thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. So the word for prove is to test, to try, um, and the word for strive is to strive with words. So who was that man, thy holy one, with whom the children of Israel were striving? in both these incidents? Well, it has to be the angel of God's presence. Because it wasn't Yahweh who stood on the rock, but it was the angel of his presence that stood on the rock. And Moses struck the rock, and the angel caused that water to come forth. Um... So Exodus 23, verses 20 to 23. And let's look at the Isaiah one, Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, and verse 9. In all their affliction he was afflicted, Isaiah 63, verse 9. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. So there was the man, thy holy one, God's representative, Yahweh's representative, who was present at these instants. And it was the one, as I say, that was stood on the top of the rock when Moses used the serpent rod to smite the rock, and it brought forth life-giving water. Uh, and we know the parallel, what, what it is standing for, that Christ had to be smitten. But out of the smitten rock of Christ came forth living water 
that would sustain all those who put their trust in him. And so we have this wonderful picture of this angel, Yahweh's representative, a very fitting type for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who through smiting, we think of Isaiah 53, Micah chapter 5, Zechariah 13, all talks about the coming one being smitten, smiting on the cheek. Uh, we esteemed him stricken of God. Um, out of him would flow living waters to sustain the congregation or the ecclesia, the house of God. And there's a number of references uh, there that bear that up. And that's why, as we know, Moses was told the second time to speak to the rock because, uh, in effect, what Moses was doing was what Paul said in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 6, you know, you're putting Christ to an open shame. If this rock is smitten again, there is only one smiting. Unlike the law, where there were many sacrifices year by year, under the new covenant, one offering for sin. And so Moses, though he wouldn't appreciate that what was, he was doing was part of a, a bigger type, he was breaking that type in smiting the rock. And especially using that rod of Aaron's, which speaks of resurrection, um, life from the dead. It wasn't appropriate to use that as an instrument of smiting. This was, uh, uh, he was told to use that rod because what was going to happen here was a representation of the outpouring of water, um, spirit life, when the Lord Jesus comes back at the time of the resurrection, that which Aaron's rod stood for. Uh, but Moses was provoked by Israel's lack of faith. And so it's a very sad incident, but... Uh, that is part of life. And um, we have to remember to not have lack of faith. It brought dishonour to God's name and it led to the death of these two great men. But it was time now, having received the water, so they were um, in good spirits again, to move on and for Aaron to die. So just go back to our map. Uh, we know that he died on Mount Hor. Now, traditionally, Mount Hor is put over there by Petra. But the problem with that is we'd already, uh, we read, didn't we, that before Aaron died, messages had been sent to the Edomites asking if they could pass through, and they were told no, and so they said, well, Moses said, we'll pay for the water and the food. And Edom replied by coming with an army. So there could be no possibility that that was Mount Hall because that's right in the middle of Edom territory because the territory of Edom reached right out to Kadesh Barnea um, as we read in verse 16 of chapter 20. Uh, Behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. So Edomite territory came all the way almost to Kadesh Barnea. So it doesn't make sense that Mount Hor was uh, in the middle there. There is an alternative venue which is about 15 miles to the north of Kadesh, and that's this uh, Jebel Madura, um, so about 15 miles north of Kadesh. And it was probably located on the way of the spies. Because if we just jump ahead, and if you've got your Bibles open at chapter 21, uh, when uh, immediately after the burying of Aaron, the next thing is, when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel. And we're going to be looking at that. But um, if uh, there is Arad to the north, and uh, if they were on the way to the spies, as you saw when you were looking at uh, Numbers 13, that the spies went up from Kadesh Barnea, 
uh, up through Arad, up to Hebron and northwards. And Israel at this time were on that road. So miles away from Petra, they were going northward into the land. And they were attacked. But we'll, we'll come back to that, but it's just to reinforce the, the probability of this being Mount Hor rather than over at Petra. So, um, we read, didn't we, uh, in chapters 20 and verses 22 to 29, how that they come to Mount Hor, and uh, Aaron is told that you're going to die because of the rebellion, and Eliezer and Aaron and Moses ascend up the mountain, and Aaron is uh, stripped of his uh, high priestly garments, they're put on Eliezer, and uh, he dies, and presumably Moses and Eliezer cover him with stones on the top of the mountain, and they descend uh, from the mountain, and uh, they then stay there for 30 days, mourning for the death of Aaron. We know that Aaron died, it's not in this chapter, but Numbers 33 and verses 38 and 39 tells us it was the first day of the fifth month of the 40th year, at the age of 123. And again, this is part of Paul's argument in Hebrews chapter 7, uh, of the weakness of the law compared with Christ, and they truly were many priests because they would not they were not suffered to continue by reason of death they were a mortal priesthood and here was the death of the first high priest who were many more that would follow who would die and it's interesting to see a contrast between the Aaronic priesthood and uh, Christ the Melchizedek priesthood Aaron was the type the Lord Jesus was the shadow of it, the reality of what uh, Aaron was the shadow. Both were chosen by God. Aaron was ceremonially made clean by the law, whereas the Lord Jesus, by his life and his character, lived a sinless life. So much greater than Aaron. Aaron was given garments for glory and beauty, the high priestly garments, whereas the Lord Jesus, his whole character reflected God's character. He was clothed with righteousness, both consecrated by God. Aaron had to use animal blood to sprinkle and to sanctify himself. The Lord Jesus was sprinkled with his own blood. Aaron offered for himself and for his people. You know, the Lord Jesus offered for himself and for his people. But Aaron's was a mortal priesthood, whereas the Melchizedek priesthood is an immortal one. The old covenant had many offerings, the new covenant just one offering. So, we, we've come then to the end of chapter 20 and we come into chapter 21, which we didn't read, but uh, has a lot of interesting points in it. So uh, they were traveling by the way of the spies. So they were going northward from Mount Hor when the king of Arab uh, came against them. Now, we remember when they first spied out the land, and they came back with an unfaithful report, and God condemned them to 38 years wandering in the wilderness, that uh, there were some of them, having heard that, they were happy to wander for 38 years, decided to disobey God, uh, and went and went northwards and attacked uh, the area of, same area, this area around Arad, and were defeated, and they were chased as far as Hormah. Well, tables are now reversed. So let's just, because we didn't read the chapter, let's just uh, read the first three verses of chapter 21. When King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto Yahweh and said, 
If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And Yahweh hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. Takes us back to the first incident of the spies. So here was Israel travelling northwards and conquering these Canaanite cities in the south. And you can imagine what a, a high they must have been on. Uh, in spite of the death of uh, Miriam and Aaron, God was with them. They were in the 40th year. They were now beginning to conquer the land. They had taken the king of Arad. But God had other plans for them. The time hadn't yet come for them to conquer the land. They just had a foretaste and they had to turn round and head southward. Because it wasn't God's intention that they enter the land and conquer the land until the 40 years had expired. God uses his timetable. He sticks to his timetable. And so the time hadn't run its course. And also it was God's intention that they would cross over Jordan from east to west rather than going up the land and then going from west to east. That's another story. Um, so they were told to go southwards and we can imagine how disheartened they must have been to having had that initial success of taking a bit of the land to then turn around and travel southwards. And so uh, they would have to retrace their steps because they say all within that area was Edomite territory and they were skirting around so they went all the way down south to Ezion Giba um, and it was as they were travelling uh, northeastwards to go round Edom that we read in verse 4, uh, what we've got at the top there, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. It was a difficult, it was a, a very um, treacherous uh, part of the country, very narrow ravines, very rocky, very stony. And as... Israel was won't, we read in verse 5, um, chapter 21, verse 5, the people spake against God and against Moses, wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this like bread. And we read that God sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now in that region there is this carpet viper which is a very venomous, one of the most venomous of the uh, vipers and it, it, it is uh, a very bad tempered, um, very prolific, they, you, you usually if there's one there's going to be thousands of them, very prolific, common in this kind of area, its bite is fatal it may take several days before uh, you die uh, and often after a while you feel better and then it kicks in again and you end in agonising death as the venom breaks down the capillaries and ruptures the blood corpuscles finally causing death by massive internal haemorrhage. So a pretty nasty death. So what did God say? Yahweh said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. It was a matter of faith, wasn't it? We know that was the whole purpose of this. That if they had been bitten, the serpent itself had no power. It was just a brazen serpent on a pole. 
the faith was on the part of the one who had been bitten, if he had the faith to come and obey God and to look upon this serpent, then he would be healed. If he just said, well, that's stupid to look on the serpent of brass, that's not going to heal me. Well, it didn't and they died. But it's important to understand this word look. It wasn't just a passing glance. Um, two different words are used there. The first one, 7200, uh, give attention to, and again, its first usage is in Genesis 1 verse 4. God saw the light that it was good, and you can't imagine God just a quick glance at it. God considered what he had done and declared it was very good. But uh, the second time, when he beheld the serpent of brass, the word there is very strong, to look intently. And again, it's used of Abraham. Um, look, at, look now toward heaven and tell the stars. So that wasn't a casual glance, was it? Number the stars if you can. Look intently. You must have gazed in awe. And he had no child. And he was told his children are going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky. I think this is Brother Thomas's summer, right? I, my, all my pictures are all packed away, so I couldn't get it, and I couldn't read what was written on the bottom. But Brother Thomas's depiction, and in the bottom there, just enlarge it up, is his picture of uh, Moses and the serpent lifted up on a pole. It's interesting, isn't it? Just how brief the account is. Um, only occupies um, one verse that uh, uh, Moses made a serpent, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the servant of brass, he lived. Just one verse. And that reminds us, doesn't it, so much of the crucifixion account, because this is what is being depicted here. It was foreshadowing. But of course... Nobody understood what this was standing for until two and a half thousand years later, the Lord Jesus would say, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then immediately we can see the wonderful pointer that the serpent of brass taking away the sting of the serpent bite. This is what was being represented. It was pointing forward to the one that should come. And of course, the verse that follows John 14 and 15 is John 16, which I think is probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the whole of Scripture, because everybody reads it, God so loved the world. Well, that isn't the Greek word that is used. That would be a completely different word. This 3779 is in this way. And again, the first usage in the New Testament is now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this way, on this wise. This was how God demonstrated his love to the world by giving his son that those who have faith in a smitten Lord Jesus might be saved. The vast majority of the world just ignores. Um, and we can see that clearly because if we put that verse that just had as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, in this way, same word, um, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we can see that belief was the essential in Numbers chapter 21. So, we can see the parables. The people were bitten by the serpent. And that represents the mortality of man. It takes us back to Genesis chapter 3 and the serpent introduction of sin. And from sin, death was brought into the world. A serpent of brass, uh, representing the Lord Jesus... <coughs> Uh, he was of our nature through Mary, but he had no venom. This was a harmless uh, serpent. It was made of brass, flesh, but harmless. 
and his body was prepared through fiery trials of his life. So a serpent made of brass cast in the fire, a very apt um, prefiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses nailed it to a pole. The Lord Jesus was nailed to a pole, a stake. And those who would look to him, it brought life. If we have faith, disbelief brings death. And we know what Paul said in Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. They couldn't comprehend how somebody could die and yet bring life. But that's faith, isn't it? God says that this is the means of salvation. And in humility, we believe that. So that serpent of brass had no magic powers. It all depended on faith. And we learn much later that, in fact, in the time of Hezekiah, in 2 Kings 18, verse 4, Hezekiah actually destroyed the serpent of brass, which had been preserved all through many uh, centuries because it was being used for idolatry. So just finally, and time has gone, the, the uh, closing part of chapter 21 just depicts the conquest, having skirted around Edom, uh, travelled up through the middle of Moab, and upwards, conquering the Ammonites and the um, uh, uh, Bashan, and so taking the east bank of the Jordan. It's interesting, there's just a little reference in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, tells us that Edom and Moab, uh, Edom did relent a bit, um, but they did sell food and water to Israel. So I think they did skirt around Edom, but they did provide food for them. But they seem to have gone through the middle of Moab. Um, Moab was not so uh, against them as Edom. Uh, and they passed through but didn't conquer because they were told not to touch the Moabites. Uh, but they conquered all the east bank and took all that land. And then they returned back to Shittim, to that camp, and remained there opposite Jericho while the last few months of that 40th year. So uh, an interesting two chapters, uh, lots of little incidents there, and I've enjoyed preparing it. Thank you.